Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, hopefully you can see the warmer, wetter, windier and wilder webinar um, slide in front of you. My name is Stephanie Bush and I will be moderating the presentation. I work at the Halton Environmental Network, otherwise known as HEN. HEN strives to make the community of Halton a region with educated citizens, engaged stakeholders and best practice policies for climate change mitigation and adaptation and environmental sustainability. And we're very pleased that you can be with us tonight for this session. We continue to remember and honor the indigenous children lost or hurt through the residential school system in Canada, as well as their families and communities. We also acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the direct descendants of the Anishinaabek peoples as the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land upon which we live, work and conduct ourselves. We acknowledge our treaty relationship and responsibilities to both the land and these original peoples. We also recognize that this land is rich in pre-contact history and customs, which includes the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee, and since European contact has and continues to become home for indigenous and non-indigenous peoples. And it is in the spirit and intent of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, whereby we will collectively care for and respect the land, water, animals and each other in the interests of peace and friendship and for the benefit of not only ourselves but our future descendants. Just to keep in mind this evening that if you require closed captioning during the presentation it has been enabled so please reach out to a HEN team member through our chat box if you need any support in activating that. We have a few more guidelines for you as well. Please note that since this is a webinar, you will remain muted and without the option for video. The chat box can be used to make comments or to let us know if there are any technical issues that you need support with. For questions, please use the Q&A button. You should have the ability there to see other questions that have been posed and you can upvote those questions that you also want to have answered. If we're short on time, I will be asking the most popular questions only, so that upvoting really does help me in uh, moderating the question and answer period which will take place at the end of the presentation. In addition, we'll have a couple of Zoom polls and a word cloud activity through a Menti this evening. So instructions will be provided, but please perhaps have another window opened on your device or a secondary device to log into Menti when the time comes. I'd, love to I'd like to introduce now Trisha Henderson, uh, who is our main speaker for the evening. Trisha uh, has been working in the Climate Action Department of the Town of Oakville since 2006. Prior to working for the town, she worked for various conservation authorities and nonprofit environmental groups, both in Ontario and in New Brunswick, conducting environmental monitoring, mostly related to water quality. She graduated with a Bachelor's of Science with a mixed degree from Sir Sanford Fleming College and Trent University, focusing on sources of land and water pollution. Through her position with the town and working on climate change issues over the past decade or so, she decided to volunteer with the Canadian Red Cross and more recently pursue her degree in disaster and emergency management. We're very pleased to have Tricia join us tonight and I will be passing it over to her. Great, thank you Stephanie for the introduction and thank you very much to everyone for attending tonight's webinar and taking two of the most important steps you can as an individual to address climate change, which is first educating yourself and second engaging in climate conversations with others. So thank you for being here. I realize the topic of climate change can often leave us feeling overwhelmed and I really want to be conscious of that through the discussion tonight. Although climate change is a serious and immediate risk, we are also living through a global health pandemic and some are experiencing more stress and anxiety than usual. Keeping the topic of climate change lighthearted is an unusually tall task, but I do hope to add some optimism and I hope that you leave this discussion feeling more informed and empowered. The overview of today's presentation is as follows. I will begin by reviewing four terms commonly used in co climate conversations. Many of you may already be familiar with the terms, but this is just to ensure everybody has a common understanding. We will then dive into the climate analytics and look at both extreme weather that has impacted us in the recent past and what the data is saying to expect towards the end of the century. We will also have a look at what risks climate change poses to us locally. 
Once we understand what the data is telling us and what our risks are, we will introduce you to some of the work that the town, the region, and the Halton Environment Network are doing to help, re help reduce our vulnerabilities. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, I'd like to begin just by reviewing four common terms that are associated with climate change and that you will hear throughout this presentation, uh, just to ensure we are all discussing and understanding the terms in the same way going forward. Uh, so first, there's the term greenhouse gas, often referred to as GHGs or even just emissions. Greenhouse gases are in the Earth's atmosphere and they are gases that trap heat. These gases allow sunlight to pass through the atmosphere, but they prevent the heat from escaping the atmosphere, acting like a greenhouse, which is why it is termed the greenhouse gas effect or the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases are emitted by natural methods, such as the natural decay of vegetation or the eruption of volcanoes, and by man-made methods, such as the burning of fossil fuels and other industrial practices. The main greenhouse gases are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, ozone, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbons. As mentioned, these trap gases are causing the earth to warm like a greenhouse, and therefore the climate to change. And in some areas of the world, they are changing at an exceedingly high rate, which is causing a variety of impacts on a global scale, such as droughts, forest fires, flooding, and much, much more. Canada, for instance, is warming twice as fast as the global average. Next slide, please. The next two terms that are often heard when discussing climate change are the terms mitigation and adaptation. Climate mitigation refers to actions that are taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. Climate mitigation measures include active and alternate transportation options, conserving energy, and utilizing renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, or the power of water. The term climate adaptation refers to actions that we take to manage the risks that we are already experiencing or to the risks that are projected in the future due to climate change. There are several win-win actions that address both climate mitigation and adaptation that are represented in this middle section. For example, planting trees, we know that trees absorb carbon dioxide, which mitigates one of the most problematic greenhouse gases, but the planting of trees also provides stormwater management benefits, which would be considered an adaptation action. These are known as our win-wins, and we look for these constantly while developing plans throughout the town. True resilience to climate change occurs when both mitigation and adaptation actions are being addressed. And this is what we will talk about more through today's presentation. Next slide, please. So great, so now that we have our terms straight, we can move on to the climate analytics and look at some extreme weather events that have occurred in the recent past here in the GTA and what the data tells us about our future climate here in Oakville. Next slide. Great, so as you will learn throughout this presentation, uh, this here isn't the only method that the town is using to examine historical weather data. This is just an infographic that depicts a few of the extreme weather events that took place in the greater Toronto area during the four year span of 2014 to 2018. As I was just reviewing the presentation with the team about 10 minutes ago, we realized that this infographic is turning up quite fuzzy and I apologize for that. Um, it is available on our website and we can provide a link after if you do wanna take a closer look. Uh, this infographic essentially depicts the type of extreme weather event that occurred, the time and place that it occurred and what the environmental, economic, safety and social impacts that resulted from these events were. This infographic is just one method that we use to communicate the seriousness of climate change to local audiences. So I'll give you a moment just to have a look at some of the events. Um, once again, I do apologize for the clarity issues, um, but as you can see, a lot of these uh, events have either caused localized flooding, a lot of the high wind and ice storm events have caused power outages or the closure of major transportation routes. And of course, the heat and the cold alerts always pose health and safety risks to our community, especially those um, vulnerable members of our community that might be uh, living without the proper amendments to take care of themselves in extreme hot or cold temperatures like that. Okay, so next slide, please. 
Once again, that is available on our website um, if you wish to take a closer look. Great, so as important as it is to look at past events to help prepare us for the future, it's just as or even more important to look to the future climate projections to know exactly what we're preparing for and to what degree we need to prepare. Uh, and so town staff developed the climate projections report in collaboration with the city of Burlington. Um, and I'd like to give uh, the city of Burlington staff member, Fleur Sturach Hogan, a call out right now. Uh, she is on the call today and she was critical to the success and the development of this report and to the quality of the report. So thanks again for collaborating on that. So the, available, the availability of local climate data has become very accessible uh, in Canada over even just the past five years with the Ministry of Environment and Climate Change collaborating with Health Canada and the Prairie Climate Consortium and several other educational institutions to make accurate and reliable climate data available to everybody. Uh, so what I am accessing and what I am going to show you here today is available at your fingertips as well um, by accessing the climateatlas.ca website. Uh, so the majority of data used in the climate projections report was retrieved from this website, climateatlas.ca, and it is a trusted resource used to inform Canadian municipal climate action plans. As you can see from the screenshot here, it is a very user-friendly platform. And I encourage you, if you do have an interest in this, which you obviously do from being here tonight, that you uh, pull it up on your Google browser and actually play around with it. You can get a lot of information. Uh, thank you, uh, Janie, for posting that in the chat box, the link. Uh, you can retrieve a lot of great information and a lot more information than I'm actually going to show you today. Um, so take, take a look at that if you have the chance. Uh, so the data contained in the climate projections report depicts how the climate in Oakville is projected to change under both high and low greenhouse gas emission scenarios. The low emission scenario referred to as RCP 4.5 represents moderate greenhouse gas concentrations in our atmosphere, resulting from substantial global climate mitigation measures. So we would use the RCP 4.5 to gauge what our climate is going to do if globally we took significant measures to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. The high emission scenario, referred to as RCP 8.5, represents the highest GHG concentrations in the atmosphere, resulting from, as they say, business as usual emissions. So unfortunately, this is the current trajectory that we are on globally, and it is the recommended scenario to use for developing municipal climate change plans. So we are preparing for the most extreme and for global uh, emissions to kind of stay on the trajectory that they're on right now. So approximately 40 different variables related to hot weather, cold weather, temperature, precipitation, and agriculture were modeled for the two future timeframes of 2021 to 2050 and 2051 to 2080. And then they were compared to the baseline timeframe of 1976 to 2005. The data variables that were not found on climateatlas.ca, including ice cover on Lake Ontario, high wind events, and local projections on in the intensity and duration of rain events were retrieved from alternate sources such as environment, uh, environment and Climate Change Canada, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and from our local municipality, our local municipal stormwater and emergency management departments. Additional information on the methodology used in accessing and analyzing this, uh, this climate data can be found within the climate projections report. And so I urge you to check out that report if you want to know anything else about accessing and analyzing the data um, or anything more about what I'm not going to present to you today. As I mentioned, there are 40 variables included in this report, and we're really only going to discuss under 10 of them probably today in this presentation. So at a high level, the results of the report uh, indicate that Oakville, as you might have guessed from the name of this webinar, uh, we'll be experiencing significantly warmer, wetter, windier, and wilder weather, as I will explain in greater detail using the following infographics. Next slide, please. Thank you. 
So this infographic here, I just want you to have a look at the data on your screen while I just explain a little bit to you about the methodology used here and what um, the infographics going forward are going to explain to you. We are going to talk about the actual data that is represented here in the following two slides. So just have a quick look and let some of it set in and see what it means to you. So as I mentioned, these infographics that I will be showing you represent some of the most significant changes that Oakville is projected to see related to temperature, precipitation, wind, freezing rain, and thunderstorm activity. But there are several other variables included in the report that are not included in these infographics. Also, the report depicts the low emission scenario and the 2021 to 2050 timeframe, whereas the infographs only represent the high emission scenario, which was RCP 8.5 and the projections for the 2051 to 2080 timeframe. And you will see that right under the heading there of the climate projections report, just as a reminder, it is listed right there. Okay, so now that you've had a look at that, we can advance to the next slide. Again, a lot of the data uh, for temperature is still represented here, all of the same data actually. Uh, but this infographic actually uh, provides some information on what some of the impacts could be to both the corporation of the town of Oakville and to the community. So as you can see from this infographic, the annual temperatures in Oakville are on the rise, but, is, but what is most significant and concerning is the increase in winter temperatures and summer, and summer temperatures. The data shows a 4.7 degree rise in average winter temperatures, resulting in the average winter temperature being above freezing during this time frame. With these rising winter temperatures, Oakville is bound to see less snow accumulation and an increase in freezing rain and ice storm events, of which we know often cause damage to our urban forests, power outages, and personal injuries, among other things. The increase to summer temperatures is also a great concern to the health of residents and our natural environment. The hottest day of the year was 34.2 degrees during the baseline time frame, and is expected to reach 39 degrees by the 2051 to 2080 time frame. Please keep in mind that all temperatures represented here in this infographic are without the humid X factored in, which makes these summer temperature increases of even more greater concern. The data for Oakville projects that we will see a significant increase to the number of heat alerts and heat waves, as you can see from the graph on your screen. Halton Region currently calls a heat alert at 31 degrees. As you can see from the graph, we will be seeing a significant increase in days above 30, 32, and 34 degrees in the future timeframe of 2051 to 2080. These temperature increases pose a series of risks to the environment with the increased stress to vegetation in our urban forests, as well as, as an increase to energy use, which not only impacts the environment, but also impacts our finances as well. The hot season is projected to get hotter and longer, meaning we will be using more energy for longer periods of time and emitting more greenhouse gas emissions in the process. There are many more impacts that you can see on the screen um, that I have not covered right now, and even more that are listed in the report. Next slide, please. Great, so annual precipitation is also projected to increase, but it is the increase to the intensity and the frequency of the short duration rain events that is of most concern to the town due to the potential to cause localized flooding. Uh, the town is using these future precipitation projections to plan proper stormwater controls in all new developments within the town and also when we look to retrofit some of our older areas of town and incorporate some low impact development uh, techniques and stormwater management processes beyond just increasing pipe size and pond size. So we will discuss some more of those programs that are available that the town of Oakville is doing and that are available to Oakville residents that can help you build your resilience to extreme rain events. Under the heading of windier and wilder, you will see that high wind events are projected to increase. And this is something that we have already been noticing over the past several years. High wind is now uh, creeped up the ranks of our emergency management hazard and risk assessment. 
and is causing a lot of damage when they do occur. Um, as we know, high wind events also have the potential to damage trees, cause power outages, and very often they cause personal injury. Um, a great thing that you can do in and around your home and property is ensure that items such as outdoor furniture, umbrellas, garbage cans, or really anything else that can take flight is secured down or put away and to uh, ensure that you have your trees properly pruned, um, especially if they're hanging over, you know, say uh, your house or your driveway or somewhere that your kids play, something like that, um, where, where damage could occur if, uh, if a branch were to fall. Um, I did mention that freezing rain events were projected to increase uh, in the future. Um, but I didn't say by how much. Uh, the projections for the 2051 to 2080 timeframe uh, show a 45% increase um, for this area, uh, which is quite significant. If we all think back to the December 2013 uh, freezing rain ice storm event um, and the extended power outages that it caused uh, all across southern Ontario, um, we can just start to imagine uh, some of the damage and what an increase of 45% uh, would mean to this area. So again, um, I urge you to take a more detailed look at the climate projections report and even these infographics on your own so that you can uh, get a more comprehensive look on how the climate is going to change. Um, another thing that I did wanna point out here um, is that with the uh, higher temperatures, it also has the potential to increase thunderstorm activity uh, in the area. And as we've noticed, um, our fluctuating Great Lake levels are often impacted uh, by the wind as well. So uh, especially here in Oakville, we had significant flooding um, when the lake levels were already at one of its highest points, but then when it was coupled by easterly winds, we saw even more shoreline damage and flooding occur. Um, so yes, these uh, climate projections and these impacts are of concern on their own, but they're of even more concern once they start uh, overlapping each other and impacting and occurring at the same time. Next slide, please. Okay, great. Uh, so now I'm going to briefly uh, discuss some of the things that the town uh, is doing in regards to climate change. Uh, the town has a fairly large portfolio of climate initiatives and we have been uh, working on climate initiatives uh, since I started in 2006. Um, and I've always had an environmental strategic plan or a climate strategy kind of guiding um, our process and our work plans. Next slide, please. So one of the most major and recent um, actions taken uh, by the town was in 2019 when town council declared a climate emergency. Uh, this declaration followed hundreds of other municipalities and global climate leaders. Uh, to inform this decision, the climate action staff were consulted with prior and they presented a portfolio of initiatives that are taking place across the corporation and the community to address climate change. So I urge you, if you do want to look for a full portfolio of initiatives taking place across the town um, over the past several years, I urge you to check out that report. I will be going into quite some detail of uh, projects that are currently underway, um, that have currently taken place or underway over the past year. Um, so this climate emergency resolution directed town staff to report annually on climate change actions and update the 2014 climate change strategy to address these six key deliverables, as you can see here on your screen. So they wanted us to address their corporate operations, identify the public's role and the actions that the community can take uh, to embed a climate lens into our asset management program and our town's official plan, uh, to increase action and ambition for the town's climate change activities, and then to uh, develop a strategy that includes performance metrics to track our progress and discuss timelines for achieving these key deliverables and major milestones, um, which we all have under work right now. Um, I did provide a report to council last night that outlined the progress made 
since the climate declaration, um, it, in the last year of the climate declaration, sorry, uh, this council report contains links to all past reports and to much of the information that is in today's presentation. So if you're looking for more information on past initiatives or what I am presenting today, that, that would be a great resource for you to look for. Next slide, please. So as required by the third uh, deliverable of the climate declaration, town staff are updating the 2014 strategy. Uh, and we are doing this uh, by using the climate projections report, uh, the findings of that report to inform our risk and vulnerability assessments that are taking place across the corporation. And you can see listed there, the nine different or the eight different uh, risk and vulnerability assessments that we are conducting. So we're doing ones on our updating the one on our creeks and channels, our urban forestry trails and natural areas, our harbors and Lake Ontario. We're also doing one on health and wellness, recreation and tourism. And then under the built environment, we're uh, re-examining land use, planning and building, our stormwater and transportation infrastructure and operations. Um, in the 2014 strategy, the town team identified 39 vulnerabilities related to climate. 11 of those uh, were deemed medium to high risk for the corporation. Uh, we also identified hundreds of different actions that can be taken by both the corporation and the community to reduce these vulnerabilities. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the town has several initiatives underway to address uh, corporate facilities and corporate operations. Those listed here are just a select few. Many others are still being identified through the risk and vulnerability assessment update. Provincial regulations do require municipalities to consider climate change in their asset management planning and the town is meeting and in some instances actually exceeding these requirements. Town staff are taking a hard look at the life cycle analysis as it relates to environmental and fiscal responsibility decision making, and they are applying a climate lens to many of the key performance metrics that are already being collected. While they are doing this, they are also identifying gaps of where we need to collect more data. The town is also developing a facility and construction maintenance resiliency plan and incorporating climate considerations into everything from standard operating procedures to facility design and construction. The town has already already has a corporate building standards, a LEED silver standard in place and many energy conservation and greenhouse gas reduction targets that it is meeting through a variety of initiatives, including lighting retrofits and equipment retrofits. As you may know, Oakville Transit is also electrifying its buses and the town is more moving towards an electric fleet for both its outdoor cars and trucks, as well as for some of its indoor fleet that include arena ice edgers, Zambonis and more. The town is also strengthening the climate mitigation and adaptation requirements for special events, having event organizers take, in, take natural resource conservation, greenhouse gas emissions and wasteful practices into consideration before planning and delivering events in Oakville. In regard to planning and land use with the town, council approved the recommended official plan amendments for the hospital district that addresses climate mitigation through land use policies and designations that encourage mixed use, high densities, low impact development, natural heritage system protection, the use of transit and active transportation, sustainable building design, and for the first time in Oakville, it requires proponents of development to undertake a district energy feasibility study as part of the application. Climate policies are identified as a key initiative to the town's ongoing official plan review. Next slide, please. Great, so as I mentioned, the town has had an active role in climate communications and education since the beginning of my career with the town in 2006. Uh, staff attend community events prepared by others and hosted by others. And we also host our own events to, pr to, sorry, to promote natural resource conservation, environmental protection, and personal preparedness to extreme weather. Oakville Green has also continued to work with the town to educate and engage the community in public plantings, pollinator projects, invasive species removal, and low impact development projects. 
Although Oakville Green was still able to host 57 events and engage over a thousand residents over the past year during COVID, they report this is only about a third of the impact that they had prior to the pandemic. As we learned in one of the first slides of this presentation today, many of these initiatives I've described that are taking place by Oakville Green are in that win-win category in that they help to mitigate emissions as well as provide necessary climate, climate adaptation benefits by encouraging biodiversity and natural stormwater management methods. I will speak more of the collaborative programs. Actually, Stephanie will speak more of the collaborative programs that we have going on with the Halton Environment Network, which include the Halton Climate Collective and Oakville Ready just a little bit later on in the presentation. I am going to jump right into the community energy plan. Next slide, please. Thank you. So Oakville Energy Task Force was formed in 2018 and it comprises a team of community leaders from local business, government, utilities, school and community groups. These stakeholders advise and champion the community energy planning and implementation process for Oakville. Community energy planning and implementation helps the town, residents and businesses work together to reduce energy costs, and greenhouse gas emissions while strengthening the local economy and building an affordable and reliable energy future. The community energy plan has been developed and approved by council and is now in the process of implementation. Future Energy Oakville has been established and work has begun to implement the priority projects identified in the plan. Staff provided the community energy strategy implementation update report to town council in April of this year. I urge you to read this report if you're interested in learning more about the process taken to develop this plan or the priority projects that are currently being implemented across town. Next slide, please. Great, uh, so that kind of caps off just a couple of the initiatives um, taking place by the Corporation of Oakville. Um, now I'm just going to tell you a couple of the initiatives that Halton Region has going on. Uh, so they also do have a variety of programs to help protect the public uh, from some of the impacts of climate change. So by participating in either the Halton Basement Flooding Assessment and Subsidy Program or their Downspout Disconnection Program, it will help you protect your house from potential flooding that could occur from these extreme and frequent uh, rain events. Increased temperatures and precipitation may also lead to an increase in mosquito and West Nile virus action in the Halton region. And the region is responsible for conducting the monitoring and testing for West Nile virus. Halton also conducts the monitoring and testing for black-legged ticks that have the potential to carry Lyme disease. Uh, once again, due to the increasing temperatures, uh, they are causing a change in migration patterns and Halton region is now actually considered a high-risk area for for the black-legged ticks. Um, and these are, uh, as I mentioned, the ticks that have the potential to carry Lyme disease, although it has uh, been a very low rate here in um, Halton region. If you look, most of the ticks that they are getting in are either the deer or the dog ticks, um, but on a provincial level, we, we have been now deemed a high-risk area. Um, unfortunately, the testing for both West Nile virus and Lyme disease is currently suspended uh, due to COVID. Um, but as usual, I'm sure they are doing their larviciding and their monitoring program um, to get a gauge on what exactly is happening there. They are just not accepting um, ticks uh, from the general public right now. Usually, you could, if you did find a tick on yourself, uh, you could send it into the region and they would test it to see first if it's a black-legged tick and second to see if it carried Lyme disease. Um, so hopefully as we start to move um, into uh, post-COVID times, if I can say that, um, this program uh, will become active again. Halton Region also houses the Emergency Management Office and you can find a lot more information on their website at halton.ca on how you can protect yourself from health and natural ha hazards uh, going forward. As I mentioned in the earlier slide, Halton Region also calls the hot, the heat and the cold alerts uh, for the region. Um, and on their website, it's very simple to sign up for um, their electronic newsletter and you can get these types of alerts right to your phone um, or your email as they occur instead of having to search them out. Um, so that is it for me. I am going to pass it over to Stephanie now to discuss some of the 
Fulton Environmental Network's uh, climate initiatives they have taking place right now. So thank you, Stephanie. Thanks, Tricia. I'll be sending it back to you right by the end there, but uh, thank you so much for what you've provided so far. So yes, the Halton Environmental Network has a few initiatives um, that we want to share with you tonight as well. So first of all, our Deep Pave Paradise uh, program is one that removes hard surfaces and replaces them with soil and vegetation. It contributes to many adaptive needs, including naturally cooling urban areas, uh, which we'll definitely need with those heat predictions that uh, Tricia mentioned. Um, it also absorbs rainfall to reduce the risk of flooding and leads to more resilient communities, among other benefits. If you'd like to learn more about this initiative through the Halton Environmental Network, you can contact Andrea at haltonenvironment.ca for more information or details. In addition, the Green Drive Oakville is another local project being explored by HEN and the Small Change Fund. This project explores the feasibility of a new community business employing local residents to install electric vehicle chargers and green driveways in, home, in homes across Oakville. So we invite you to actually to complete the survey to tell us what you think about this idea. I believe Janie is gonna pop the link to that survey into the chat box. It just takes a few minutes to complete. So we're still gathering data for this project. So we'd appreciate any input that you could provide. Um, two other summer initiatives that we've got going uh, include our pop-up cleanups and our virtual summer camp. So the cleanups are now happening and are supported by an app called Literati that tracks the type of waste collected so that this data can be used to help prevent future litter. Dylan Consulting is sponsoring this initiative and we're very grateful for their support. These pop-up cleanups are a great opportunity for high school students to get their community involvement hours as well. But anyone in the community who is doing a cleanup can use the app to track what they've collected. Uh, for more details about this initiative, you can check out HEN's website. And then in addition, our summer camp will take place virtually for the week of July 26th. Uh, please stay tuned to HEN's social media and website for the official launch and the opening of registration. So we're, we're really looking forward to that program coming soon. Moving on to some other collaborative programs now as well. The Halton Climate Collective also works to align and accentuate the climate mitigation and adaptation efforts taken in each Halton municipality, while also providing extensive climate change related educational opportunities for the community. All of the partners of the Halton Climate Collective are included here in this slide. Um, the HCC's two most impactful initiatives this year were Generation Green uh, and the HCC Reads. So our Generation Green Conference was developed by 55 youth stakeholders and engaged 596 Halton District School Board students. This conference resulted in 95 Oakville-based projects and contributed to a reduction of 2.37 billion grams of carbon dioxide equivalents locally. That, so that program is a for youth by youth program uh, and this was its second year running. So we're very proud of that initiative. HCC Reads is another collaboration between the Halton Climate Collective and Halton Public Libraries to encourage residents to read books focused on environmental protection and climate change. This year's HCC Reads engaged over 850 Halton residents to read Canadian author Celia Watt Cloutier's memoir, The Right to be Cold. We encourage you to keep an eye out for the next HCC Reads and join the virtual book club and conversation. That brings us to the Oakville Ready Program. This is our Community Climate Change Adaptation Program, which was established in 2018 with the goal of establishing seven neighborhood resiliency hubs within Oakville. The intent of Oakville Ready was to establish seven hubs across the town by utilizing faith-based organizations. These locations would be used as a short-term gathering place in times of power outages, flooding, or fire and a place to gather, charge your cell phone, have some tea and connect with your neighbors, as well as get information about the emergency and what next steps may be required. The program helps to relieve anxiety amongst the community as well as free up emergency services in the first 48 hours of an extreme event. To decide on the best locations, a risk and vulnerability, vulnerability map was created as you can see a snapshot of on your screen. All critical infrastructure, hazardous waste, population densities, banks, daycares, and areas prone to flooding are mapped to expose where the greatest risk is 
and where the need for a resiliency hub lies. To date, we have not, thankfully, had to enact any of the hubs for such an emergency, but we do engage and collaborate with them on several initiatives throughout the year. Uh, this year, we anticipate onboarding uh, a few more uh, hubs, and one is included here as Forest View. The other seven were the original hubs, hub locations. So COVID has clearly put a wrench into this program's deliverables because it is meant to be a gathering place for people to come together and, and uh, support each other during a time of uh, an emergency. Uh, but with COVID, the, the call to action shifted somewhat. Um, they continued, the hubs have continued to provide invaluable services to the community and to some of the most vulnerable members of the community. In response to the pandemic, the Oakville Ready team hosted a series of webinars to help keep connected, keep the community connected. And we hosted two food drives, collecting 2,000 pounds of food for Kerr Street Ministries, and also delivered container gardens to seniors in town so that they had fresh greens available to them for the summer. We're planning to host uh, town-wide food drives later this summer as well, so please keep an eye out for that. If you have any questions about the Oakville Ready program, please feel free to reach out to either Trisha at the town or to Lisa Kohler at HEN, they'd be happy to follow up with you. Uh, and a reminder that if you have any questions about any part of the presentation tonight, that you please put those through to the Q&A. If you see questions in the Q&A that you particularly want to hear responses to, please upvote those questions for uh, further consideration. Before returning the, to the final Zoom poll with Tricia, we also wanted to take this opportunity to share one more event that's happening this Thursday night. Um, join us in the Oakville Festival of Film and Arts for the film First We Eat. You can see the link in the chat box, I believe, that uh, Janie is going to pop that in there. Um, you can use the discount code on the screen and, in, and it will be in the chat box as well, so you can get 10% off of that event. So I'm going to pass things back to Tricia. I know that there were a couple questions going through here. I did see one on the frequency of high wind events. Um, wind was a challenging one to get data on. Uh, we did have to look at a couple different places. It was not available on climateatlas.ca. Um, it really didn't predict exactly how frequent uh, the wind events were going to get, but it did predict that the wind gusts over 70 and 90 kilometers an hour were going to increase in the future. Uh, that is the threshold, 70 and 90 kilometers an hour is the threshold when Environment Canada starts to call high wind warnings. Um, and uh, what we've seen from past events and what they did say looking into the future is that um, high wind events are on the rise. So unfortunately, I can't predict exactly how much more frequent they're going to get. Um, but for a little bit more clarity, you can uh, read that section in the report. But again, there isn't a definitive uh, answer there. I also um, read a question about the district energy. Um, could I please expand on the district energy for development? Um, so the town, as part of the community energy strategy, the town is looking at kind of a town-wide kind of district energy pre-feasibility study to see, you know, where does it make sense in the town of Oakville. Um, they're also identifying where certain projects are already taking place. We do know that some subdivisions and some developers already have plans. Um, to start looking at this and start implementing it. So we're um, taking uh, inventory of that as well. Um, and then as I mentioned, um, the planning department uh, did recommend some official plan uh, amendments uh, for the hospital district policies uh, that were accepted by council. And one of those uh, was, to, um, was to provide explicit requirements for the proponents of development to undertake a district energy feasibility study as part of their application. Um, so that did go to council um, in a June 7th uh, report. And if you would like some more information, uh, you can look at that report for it. Thank you. Um, in addition, there's some question about, you know, are we doing enough? Is, is this really, you know, are, are we doing enough essentially? And is there more that can be done that we should be paying attention to? 
Most definitely. Um, there's definitely more um, to be done, both on, you know, the corporate and community side of things. Um, there, Yeah, there's a lot more, um, I think, that we can all be doing. Um, obviously, it comes down um, to resources uh, sometimes. Um, and I, you know, I do want to give a call out to the staff that I work with. Um, climate change has taken a leading role at the town um, in regards to uh, staff, senior management, um, and town council. Um, and we have been working very diligently over, you know, the past decade and especially over the past uh, several years um, to start to integrate and embed climate change into um, most everything that we do at the town. Um, but things take time, things take money. But yes, there's, there's more to be done and uh, I encourage everybody. I think that's what's important, and that's what this uh, webinar kind of described today. There's a lot of different players um, and actors in the climate change field, um, and you know, it takes a village. It takes the businesses. It takes the municipality. It takes the residents, um, all working towards the same goal. Um, there's a question about energy. For any actions that the town has taken to reduce energy costs with light bulb changes, for example. Do they actually see much reduction in energy use or are these difficult to see due to growth like how do you measure that yep the town um, is uh, seeing some uh, great reductions in both its energy use um, and you know the emissions that result uh, from that energy use uh, they are meeting their greenhouse gas emission reduction targets on a corporate uh, scale and Yes, as you mentioned, you know, we are obviously building new buildings and things like that. Uh, the latest building um, that we put in, I believe it's Oakville Trafalgar Community Center, uh, uses geothermal. All of our buildings now are built to at least a lead standard, uh, lead silver standard, um, which also guarantees us some level of energy um, efficiency and greenhouse gas emission reductions. Um, and yeah, right now we're going, the town is going through a facility management and construction review, and we're embedding climate considerations into every facet of that review. As I mentioned, everything from, you know, just standard operating procedures, how they're using natural resources, how they're washing their floors, maintaining their buildings, their energy systems, all the way to how they're construction, uh, constructing their buildings. Excellent. And they're seeing some great monetary savings and emission savings. Excellent. Um, sort of sticking with that energy theme for a second, someone also asked in the chat to expand on the district energy plan for development. Is there more you could say about that, Tricia? Um, no, that's the one that I tried to answer before. So what I did say is that a report, no, nope, that's fine. A report did go to council on June 7th. Um, and amongst other things, um, other amendments for the hospital district, um, they did explicitly require that uh, developers undertake a district energy feasibility study as part of their application now for all new all uh, development up in the hospital district there. That's great. So if you do want more details on that, um, you can refer to that June 7th report or most likely visit the uh, planning website as well. Okay. Great, I guess I do have one more question here I'll ask you, Tricia, but then I think we'll be wrapping it up. Uh, a question about, is the town looking at changing their home development policies? Um, with examples of, um, you know, very large houses being built, many trees being cut down as a result. Uh, are we looking at reducing hard surfaces around private homes, that kind of thing? Yep, so the town is looking at um, the permeability of certain vulnerable areas of Oakville and implementing different programs and initiatives to increase permeability in those areas. Um, you know, it's um, a bit obvious, but some of our most vulnerable areas for stormwater are in the south as, um, you know, that was the earliest development. It has the least stormwater controls and it has the most redevelopment um, and loss of permeability. Um, you know, in Oakville right now. Uh, we are looking at lot level and permeability levels um, for reconstruction and uh, reconstruction of houses. And we do have a pretty stringent private tree bylaw in place. Um, so 
we do, um, you know, require that trees are protected and not cut down in these development processes. And if unfortunately, for some reason they are, they are plant, mature trees are planted elsewhere in their place. But I would have to say that that is a very, um, a not, not a widely used exception. We do have a pretty strict uh, tree bylaw here in Oakville that has been amended uh, quite a few times to make it even stricter. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you to Tricia for being here tonight and providing us with this uh, really ins helpful information. Um, and thank you to all of our participants who joined us this evening and asked some great questions as well. This session has been recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again, or you've got friends who you think might be interested, it will be available by the end of this week for review through the HEN YouTube channel and it will be posted through our social media when it's available. Um, so thank you again for being here this evening and uh, wish you all a good night. Great, thank you very much.